Welcome everybody to Big and Robot Presents Entertaining Guest. Today we are speaking with somebody you probably know who they are once we say their name. You're going to be kind of surprised, but uh, we're going to be talking with Ken Levine, the man behind Bioshock. Hey, Ken Levine, do you know a thing about video games? Probably not as much as you guys, but I, I know. I know well, I, to your credit, I, I think you probably know more about us because you've, you've made a couple of those. Yeah, you, you, there's such a thing as not too much about video games. Like one of the one of the, the bad things about making video games is it does sort of you start seeing behind the curtain a little bit. Uh -huh. Some of the magic goes away, but I, there is a part of me that kind of wishes I never made video games so I could still experience them. And like I never, I wish I never wrote a movie a little bit too, because same with movies and sort of anything you work on, you, you kind of it, it does kind of demystify it. But but I tell you, that every now and then I play something and it just completely wipes away that knowledge and you just get to flow into it which is great uh oh it sounds it sounds like we may just have to push through all our topics so you and i can talk about breath of the wild afterwards that's exactly yeah that's exactly, yeah. yeah yeah that's well, the we'll, game we'll, there you go we'll see, we'll see we'll see if we, we'll see if we get there we'll see if we get there yeah. so how do people usually know you ken like what's what is the title what is when when you approach someone and they're like oh hi nice to meet you and then of course because everyone offers their job because I guess that's 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 where we're trying to establish our pecking order. What do you say when when you introduce yourself to someone? I, I just usually introduce myself as Ken. Like I don't come up to people on the street and say, "Hi, I'm Ken Levine." Well, it's I mean, great. like if, <laughs> if you're at a party or something, I just sort of say my name. You know, if it comes up, that that's great. But it it is. Um, yeah, I, I think there's definitely a place where you could become that person where you're like walking around and like, oh, uh, by the way, have you heard of a game called Bioshock? You know, I, that's, I don't think that's a good way to go about sort of living your social life. Mm -hmm. um, I, mean, I mean, there are weird things that happen. Like sometimes you'll meet somebody or you'll be walking down the street and, and you, get, you get some really nice people who come up to you and say, oh, are you Ken Levine? And, and, that, and, that. and then you sometimes meet some people and they, or, or you, they don't come up to you whether you realize they know who you are. And, they, and there's this sort of look that you get of recognition, <laughs> which is both really sweet and and and, and nice, but it, it sometimes you're not sure what it is, and just somebody looking at you a weird way. And but it's usually you know they they recognize you from you know some interview you did or something. Right. And but people are generally super 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 nice. I mean every now and then you get like weird shit. Like I G Levine was at my restaurant and he ordered five drinks, you know, and you're like what. <laughs> um, I'm like being watched. Like how many drinks I I, I ordered, and like, and that, that gets a little weird. But um, in general, it, it's any social interaction where people sort of learn who I am and they're a fan. It's almost always ends up in a really nice, lovely um, exchange with them. Nice, nice. So, who would you say you really are, though? Because like I know the media tends to have an idea. I think probably. People see you as this 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 games director or storyteller or, or as you said the creator of Bioshock, but who would you say you really are? Were you a bit of a class clown? Were you maybe yeah. like you know I, I was I was not like a super popular kid. I, I, you know I I probably I probably fit a you know how there's like a serial killer profile. I fit a you know game developer profile probably. <laughs> <laughs> Most know. likely to make video games, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Book. Outside. Yeah, yeah outsider liked reading comic books. you know this is before there was nerd culture you know i grew up in the 70s and 80s oh so my god there's, there's, i already want you on future episodes but i'm sorry to you why <laughs> why why what about because it's no i just for me the idea of 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 nerd culture and all that jazz is, is something that i always like to talk about and i'm like we have to have him back on he's saying all the things i like yeah, that's that's kind of what we do on the regular editions of the show. Like we do the we do the weekly thing, and then we do what we're doing right now, where we like we've spoken to Mark Kern, and now we're speaking to you, obviously, and we're trying to you know talk to developers and people who actually make things and and get a sense of who they are and how they got there and that you know that sort of thing. So, but yeah. but our usual show is it's like hey, let's talk about comic books, let's talk about movies, you know that kind of stuff. So yeah. But sorry, well, before I interrupted you, you were saying you read comic books and you were a loner. Yeah, there wasn't there wasn't really a nerd culture back then. If if it was, it was very small. Like mm -hmm. you know, you'd go into this uh, pharmacy and they had a comic book rack, and I, I'd go and I would check the comic book rack, and that was like this tiny little. And it, the comic rack was like this spinning little. Yeah, the spinners. The spinner, yeah. you know, this yeah. little thing, and and 
But there wasn't like doc, nobody knew anything about it. You couldn't like ask the owner of the store about you know hey when's the newest <laughs> of, of X Men coming out because they just didn't know. And you know all these things that are mega franchises now. The first time I think I experienced a public acceptance of nerd culture was really Star Wars. You know when the first Star Wars came mm-hmm. out. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, the lines around the building. And I actually went to see the opening weekend, the first Star Wars, with a couple of cool jocks. I was in the fifth grade, and there was a couple of, like, cool <laughs> jocks. For some reason, they wanted to see I had never been social with them before because I wasn't really – nobody was – I didn't have a lot of friends at all. But we sort of went, ended up at the same movie together. I still don't really know how it happened, meeting these two cool kids. And they loved it, and I loved it, and that was a big deal. And it was sort of the first time I sort of was in a public space where nerd culture was being celebrated at all. But, you know, it wasn't like it is now. I mean, I just, you know, right now there's that Star Wars thing going on. I just, people had it on the screen. And, you know, the kind of deification of nerd culture just didn't exist. In fact, it was quite uh, outsider and weird. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I think a lot of us, a lot of outsiders, outsiders are attracted to nerd culture because there's a lot of aspirational qualities to it and a lot of escape qualities to it. I think those, a lot of those people became game developers. A lot of outsiders became game developers because of that exact reason. That they were sort of pushed to that because that was a comforting place for them to be. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, I grew up, I, I, you know, and I always liked video games because I didn't have a lot of friends, and that was something you could do without friends. You could play a video game. I remember the old. Sometimes you'd get an old Atari game, and like they wouldn't be like Space War had no multi had no single player component. So basically if you were to fight an enemy ship, like sometimes that actually <laughs> controllers at the same time. Uh, right. which is really tough to do, but um it didn't have a multiplayer mode. So I was sort of I mean a single player mode, so I was right. forced to do that. Yeah. So you were born in uh sixty six? Yes. Okay, because we had actually uh seen your your video when you're at Res giving the talk there. Yeah. And you had mentioned like your your earliest exposure to games is like things like, were, were things like Pong and like the the very early like Atari system and stuff. Yeah. Uh, was was gaming something that you gravitated towards, like from the very beginning? Was it something that it got it, it you know it kind of got it, its hooks into you, or was it something that like later on you came back to? Oh no no yeah, I was basically there as a fan from the very beginning. Like, the first time I saw that stuff, I was I was fascinated by it. I remember going to visit my sister at our college where they had a mainframe. You know, one of those the people that probably don't know what that is anymore. Right. Yeah, it's like an entire room, like a house filled with a computer, basically. It, exactly, and and you know, which would probably fit on your you know on your watch now. You know. This, right. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. An and, Apple Watch basically is the same kind of computing power, yeah. Yeah, probably even more, yeah. The uh, yeah. I was playing this Star Trek game, which is this sort of turn-based, I don't know if you remember, there was, like, you played on a 10 by 10 grid and you'd go around looking for planets and fighting Klingons and stuff. I, I'm sure, sure it wasn't licensed, but um, there, was no, <laughs> there was no monitor. So right. every turn was a printout on a, on a big dot matrix, a wide format dot matrix printout. So I actually took that printout home with me when I went home I would just review it over and over and over again. You know, this very crude, simple thing. But it, I was just so, so drawn to it from the very beginning. I'm not surprised I ended up making them, given my certainly. I can't say to speak to the talent, any talent I had, but certainly the my enthusiasm was off the charts. <laughs> what was uh? What was your first system? Like, what was the? What was your very first experience with games, though? Video games. Well, the first system I owned, or the first system I played. First system you played, like what, what what lit the fire for you? They used to have these dedicated, probably the first ones I played were, had these dedicated Pong machines, essentially, which you'd buy at, um, you know, at Sears or whatever. Yeah, wasn't it Magnavox that made those, I believe? Yeah, there was, I mean, there was a Magnavox, there was maybe a Fairchild one, and there were, right. there were some, I remember they used to have very simple ones. I remember seeing one over at a store, and they had like a, it was like a haunted house game, but basically all it was running was like a white dot on a screen, but you put this overlay a yeah, you laid on the screen. Lay over the screen, you pasted, yeah, yeah. which was a graphic of a haunted house. So, yeah. <laughs> I don't know if there anything beyond a dot. They were really crude. They were really right. crude, but they were like light gun games early on. And then they had Magnavox did something called an Odyssey, which was an early cartridge system, which was terrible, but you know, at least it was it was something. And then the first one I got was the, in the eighth grade. I got an Atari Twenty Six Hundred, which was oh, nice. amazing. What was what was your favorite game on the twenty six hundred? Probably Adventure. It was it was an sort of under. I don't think it gets the, the praise it deserves. It was this sort of very simple game where you would go and you'd find like find, you were trying to find this Grail, and there were these dragons who walked around who looked like chick, like basically like chickens. 
<laughs> and and but they had a lot of things that would be present. You had a dot, and you could pick up objects like swords or keys and walk around with them. I mean, a blue key would open the blue door. You know, the red key would open the red door. Um, I was playing on a black and white TV, so it's sort of like the you know the oh, man. the dark gray key would open the dark right. door. <laughs> And it was really crude, but but it was sort of the first narrative experience I ever had. And the narrative being like, you're going to get a grail, and there are steps to doing that. And there were the same steps every <laughs> time we played. But I, I think that game was more, really a predecessor to most sort of modern games in terms of it gave you a quest and stages to a quest and objects you can manipulate. Did you ever beat it? Oh, yeah, you beat it. I mean, you could literally beat it in... Five minutes, ten minutes. <laughs> oh, okay. Well, well, dang. There you go. Things have changed, haven't they? I'm yeah, like... yeah. I mean, I mean, once you learned it, you could beat it. You know, once you sort of figured out the mazes and stuff, it was literally five minutes long. Ken, oh, wow. Ken, are you are you like low key hinting that you're going to do adventure speed runs on the internet? That's yes. That's that's. <laughs> okay. well, that's, that's my next left project. On it. That, that's what I'm going to do. Yeah. Uh, I know. I, I I did an emulator of it a few years ago. I checked it out. It's an undersung hero of the gaming world. I, I think that might have been a little bit before my time, but I I, I, I could swear there might have been a, a Homestar Runner joke where they had said the dragon looked like a chicken, and that's yeah. that's where like it clicked with me. And you actually end up in its belly; it eats you. You can actually see yourself in its belly, and you you can kind of move around within the belly. <laughs> when I say you, and I say it, I'm talking about like the most crude. You were right. a dog, literally. Right. Yeah. And and it was a chicken, and you so you see this dog moving around the belly of a chicken. Um, <laughs> And that was the experience. Oh my goodness! So, what would you say you consider yourself to be first? Do you think you're a game designer, or would you say you're you're a games player? I would say at this stage I'm a game designer more because I spend yeah. more time designing than playing. Because you know, each day I'm spending eight or whatever hours mm -hmm. you know, making games, and it's not practical to be able to spend that much time playing them. But I, but I play them every day. I mean, I play games every single day, and I play different games. You know, all the time. So I went through a big Breath of the Wild period, and I was playing that. And yesterday, I was playing some new Steel Battalion or something. It was some strategy game that's that's in early access. Uh -huh. uh, I, you know, I'm, I play every day. I play. Every day. I think it's really important that you, you got to be playing games, man. If, you, if you're making them, you got to be playing. Them. Hey, you got to know about your peers' work. And like you had said, you know, once once you start to see what goes on behind the curtain, it's kind of hard to pull yourself away from that. Yeah, you, you definitely, yes, yeah. It's tricky, but you can. You said that early on you were doing screenwriting before games, so how the heck did you end up getting, I mean, because I live in Los Angeles, how did you get so successful that someone flew you out here? Because there's like no shortage of people out here with scripts to sell. When I was a teenager, I wrote mm -hmm. a bunch of plays and I put them on, and I was sort of entrepreneurial from the very beginning. Like in high school, I was producing you know, raising money and producing plays on my own um, with a friend mm -hmm. and building sets, you know, and fi finding a space in town to do them. And then in college, I did a lot of the same. And I had worked as a carpenter. I went to school at a college called Vassar, and they had a summer theater program, which they still have, which is quite renowned. It was just starting then. And they would bring in New York, a uh, New York theater company, um, mm -hmm. I can't remember what they were called. And they brought in, you know, talent from New York to do the summer stock sort of program. And I worked as a carpenter that day. Well, now here, put it this way. I was working at a restaurant, a nearby restaurant, which I got fired from, because <laughs> subordinate. And I was up there for the summer, we're staying at college in the summer, in the area at a friend's house, and I needed a job. And he was a, he ran the tech group at a theater, the summer theater program. And he said, well, we could use a carpenter. And I said, well, I'm not a carpenter. He just said like, well, don't tell them that. And uh, <laughs> so I kind of pretended to be a carpenter. And it was great. I mean, I ended up like meeting a bunch of cool people and hanging out and getting a cool girlfriend from the theater program. And I met uh, a playwright who's now a TV writer named John Robin Bates. And um, there's a lot of people who became more well known. Uh, David Street Heron was there, and, and Mary McDonnell, and John Patrick Shanley. Like these sort of like theater people became Hollywood people, but they were just young theater people at the time. I had written a play, a bunch of plays at that point, and Robbie Bates read one of them, and he liked it. And he, I said, "Well, how do I, you know, how do I make money doing this?" Because I was always, worried, I was always worried about money, uh, always worried about money. And he said, "Well, I'll send it to my agent in LA and see what she says." And she mm -hmm. liked it, and she introduced me to a woman at Paramount Pictures at the time, uh, executive, and she loved it. And um, 
uh, eventually, um, they hired me to write a um, rewrite of some terrible romantic comedy. Oh, no. And, uh, Wait, well, hold on. Wait, you, you can't just say some terrible romantic comedy. You got to tell what was the romantic comedy? Mm-hmm. What, what did this terrible movie end up being? I was going to let the I was a little man slide with it. You, you really want to you really want to put him in that I position? Go- oh, God. Okay. Hey, these are the hard questions. I'm sorry, Ken. I'm questions. sorry. I'm, I'm on your side. <laughs> I was writing this romantic comedy I was writing was it was a rewrite. So it was a script that already existed that I guess they weren't. Uh, weren't happy with. I mean, the way Hollywood where he works is they hire a writer, the guy writes a draft, and if they don't like it, generally what ends up happening, because they're not, I don't think there's a lot of sort of super sophisticated ability to work on a story with a writer, so because they're, the people you're working with are generally not writers. In general, there are exceptions. Yeah. Um, and so what they generally end up doing is if they don't like it, they, they fire that writer and they hire another writer. So often when you see in movies, and it says written by so and so and so and so and so and so. Those people actually didn't work together. They worked in sequence, and right. and often there's seven or eight or nine writers, and they don't even get listed in credits. Um, oh. And um, so every, I never, almost every project I've ever worked on, I've been I've been one of you know, a writer in a series. Um, Logan's Run was that way. I was probably, I think I was like the ninth writer. Oh wait, you worked on Logan's Run. Yeah, the, there's one that they've been working on for trying to make for a while. Oh, okay, the new version. Yeah, the new okay. version. No, I'm not that old. Gotcha. Um, I, I was like, wait a minute. That was, <laughs> that was 66. Yeah. That was one of those formative mo- movies for me. Um, oh, for sure. Um, I remember it. Yeah. For some reason, I ended up rewriting this screenplay, which was a vehicle for a um, a Christian rock singer named Amy Grant, and oh, yeah. she had just had a hit with a song called "Baby Baby" and a crossover hit, and so they want to make her a movie star, so. It was a vehicle for her, and it was, you know, the script was terrible. The rewrite I did was terrible. <laughs> I, I, I don't know why, how I ended up trying to write a romantic comedy, but, you know, it wasn't, it wasn't, I don't think it was the right thing for me. And that movie never got made. Oh, yeah, I was going to ask. It never, it never got made, then I got mothballed. It got mothballed, uh, and probably deservedly so. Um, <laughs> it's not like it was the wrong thing for everyone. I think they were trying to make something happen that just wasn't going to happen. Huh. And, um, well,. Yeah, and Amy Grant did okay anyway, so I think she she's not hurting for it. So I think I think Amy Grant. This is she's probably looking back at this. And go, man, that Ken Levine really screwed me, man. <laughs> he, he really wrote a terrible rewrite of that movie, and that killed my film career. Um, there you go. But um, yeah, so so the, that's how I got. It was sort of I, I met the right person, and I because I had got fired from it one job, got hired to do another job I was un, unqualified for. I met the right person. I was a terrible car. <laughs> I got tired to write a screenplay, and I was terrible. I didn't do a good <laughs> job with that. So basically, it was it was a series of, of of failures that sort of ended up with me being discouraged and trying to get another job writing, which was not coming. And the worst thing to be you live in LA when you're in LA and you're broke and you're trying to get writing gigs, man, people can smell that desperation on you, and they. <laughs> And they just sort of don't want to be with you. And I just got really alienated and, and, and depressed and strange. And, and I just kind of bailed out of it. I bailed out of creative work in general for a period of like seven, six, five, six, seven years, something like that. So I, another play. yeah, I, I gave up on my creative life for, for, for many years. Uh, you would, when, I think it was at Res, I believe you were talking about Thief and the kind of the, the failures in the creative process early on, trying to figure that game out and where it was going. <laughs> Has that has that process gotten any easier over time? Because you've done this, you've 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 done this so many times at this point. I would imagine that you've kind of developed a system. But like, has it gotten any easier, or do you still kind of struggle with it? Like when you're starting to come up with a concept for for a new game property, I think it's gotten harder in some ways because you sort of learn a lot of things that don't work. So a lot of things that like when I was working on Thief, I was inexperienced. So you would get excited about something, which now I'd probably look at and say oh, well, that's got problem X and problem Y and problem Z, so I'm not going to get excited by that. So you, it's hard to get as, as excited early on because you've sort of you sort of seen what can happen. On the other hand, I think, there's some, I think I talked about this at Res. There's a concept that I know of, which I did not invent, called, called the genius of the novice, which mm-hmm. is because when you don't know things, sometimes you're not afraid to try things that people who are, quote, more knowledgeable <laughs> will try. Yeah. And you're also like, well, that doesn't work, that doesn't work. And sometimes you don't leave yourself open to a mistake that actually has a lot of promise to it. So right. I, I think you just get different as you get more experienced. There are ways you there are ways it helps you, and there are ways that um, the ways that experience is, is 
hurts you. So you're a different developer when you're older. Uh, you're just you're you're definitely a different developer as you as you get. Okay. But the the process is still like I mean I guess because you're you're still trying to create something from basically whole cloth at that point. So I, I I just I wondered if just like if you developed shortcuts or anything like that to kind of mitigate some of the problems. But like, that is that is a really great uh, great concept of the the genius of the novice though because if you don't know it's impossible then you try just about anything and maybe you stumble onto some happy accidents and things like that. Exactly like like you know we we there are things in System Shock too that. Um, and thief that, you know, if I had known what I know now, I probably wouldn't have spent time on, but I can't say that like, if I was starting again with my knowledge base and I hadn't done system shock two, that I would create that same game and maybe a better game and maybe a worse game, but I wouldn't create the same game because I would try to, I would leverage my knowledge. And, you know, and we do that now. There's lots of things that I think that people think of, you know, one of games I've worked on, there's certain, some commonalities there. Um, so you, do, you develop a personal style, and there's always a, ch a challenge you have is to not let your personal style become a formula, right? Um, yeah. And so you you sort of have to force a challenge in yourself because if you ask your audience what they want, they're often going to say we want more of that, you know, we want more <laughs> of what you did before. But generally, if you if you're not growing, I think the audience eventually does walk away um, because they've sort of seen it before. And, and and another thing that you find too is that once you sort of, if you're an early on something like, you know, we were sort of an early on, you know, the hybrid of RPG and shooting, right? And now pretty much almost all shooters have, you know, RPG elements. It's a very common thing in shooters. Yeah. Um, you start looking like you're copying other work when even though you were innovative at a time, eventually people sort of, you know, they've seen those things. Like, if you go back and watch The Terminator now, it almost seems like a formulaic film, right? Because mm -hmm. you've seen so many movies like that. But you weren't there at the time when they were inventing that form, right? So, you know, the, that that film now is kind of not as... It's not as great as it was at the time because so many imitators have come along and, 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 right. and taken a stab at it. And in many cases, improved upon it. Like, innovate, like I'm not actually saying that's a bad thing. I actually, it's a, very, it's a very, you know, people build and they improve on it and actually makes the original sort of look like, uh, can make it look a little pale compared to what people have since. It makes it look kind of quaint. Yes. Like I was, I was actually having a discussion with somebody about this about a week ago when it came to, uh, when it came to Akira. Um, like back in, cause like back in like 88 or 89, a friend of mine, you know, like talking about early nerd culture back then, it was yep. very much a different thing. And we bought a bootleg copy of it. It was a dubbed subtitle copy on a VHS tape. Yep. And people don't seem to understand, like, unless you're there in that moment and you can see the impact of a thing like an Akira or like, I mean, and forgive me for, you know, puffing you up here, but Bioshock, I feel it kind of was another one of those kind of watershed, almost touchstone type moments where like it really changed the landscape of things. And unless you're there to see it, you don't really understand the importance of it. Like, and you can look back at it, like say 20 years on, like you said, like with Terminator, you can look back at that and say, oh, it's kind of quaint because you've seen people take those formulas and those ideas and refine them and make them more slick and make them more Hollywood and glitzy and glamorous and, and bigger and so it becomes it becomes kind of quaint as opposed to where it was like, oh, wow, this is this really changed like James Cameron really changed the landscape of film with that movie. I'm completely, so. completely. Now, when you yeah. watch when you watch Terminator films, it's sort of like it's kind of painful because they've they're still, you know, he keeps saying I'll be back and all the things that were so <laughs> at the time, you know, there's that part in the original Terminator where he's like cycling through his answers. You know, somebody's knocking on the door, bugging him and he's like. Fuck you, asshole. And it, just having a computer, you know, choose that line out of a database of lines was great. And now, but it becomes sort of the, it's now about fulfilling the audience ex expectations instead of, instead of, instead of confounding and surprising the audience expectations. So you can become a slave to mm. your own innovation and you have to be careful. And, and those weren't Cameron's film. You know, those are people sort of trying to, to carry it on. And I think Cameron's a guy I look at and, you know, whether you love his work now or don't love his work, I think this guy who's always trying to do something different. And I, I admire that, you know, Avatar, and Titanic, those were weird choices for him to make. Um, <laughs> he was trying. Yeah, they are, they are big jumps, like genre wise. Exactly. It's, it's a pretty big leap. Yeah. yeah. I mean, you go from the guy to a Terminator to this big, huge, romantic disaster film. And, you know, that really, you know, resonated with the tween, you know, girls at the time. 
mm-hmm. uh, especially because it was so it was such you know it was, a, it was a, a story that had a lot of romantic of us, but also had the big disaster movie component. And um, you know he, he was trying to do something different. I think that's important. And sometimes your audience is going to embrace that, and sometimes they're going to say, "Well, I don't know." But I, I think you have to be careful as a creator that you don't end up just repeating yourself. Right. You get into that that idea of like it becomes a style. It's like, oh, this is classic Ken Levine style or this is classic Cameron style. That's a, I think that's a trap that a lot of creators get into because you find that you find the thing that works and you kind of keep doing it. Yep. And it's like, oh, I'm comfortable here. This is a good spot instead of challenging yourself. And people but, like it. And that, I think, is the danger. Yeah. Is you start doing it because you know it will lead to people liking it versus saying, I need to build something that I think is exciting and fresh and cool. And then that's a real, that's a real, that's some of the reason I stopped doing Bioshock games is because I, I think it's, it, it's both a, it's a, it's a, it's, listen, let me tell you something. It is a, if you get something like that, you are very lucky. You know, you are, you, okay. the, I'm never going to spit on that or look down on <laughs> it. was so lucky to have that in my life, um, to have people respond to something like that. And it may never happen again. You know, you, you, you. You know, you do these this franchise, and you may never have something like that again. But you have to be okay with that, because otherwise, you just sort of end up chasing the same thing over and over again. And um, that that is another kind of, of you know that that is a kind of creative death that you have to watch out for. But on the other hand, you you know you understand why people want you to do more of that because you know it made them happy. Well, yeah, you you you, you create a feedback loop where it's like. Somebody's like, "Oh, this is great. Can you give me some more of that thing that is great because we liked it?" Yes. So, and then you can get stuck in that trap. That yeah, that's totally understandable. Well, totally understandable. Now that you've told me that, that gives me ideas for things I could ask you when we start talking about BioShock. But I guess the, the next question would be, do you feel games have, uh, game dev has changed since you started till now? Like, do you feel it's gotten easier or has it gotten more difficult? Well, it's gotten easier in some ways and more difficult in other ways. I mean, for me it's gotten the biggest thing for me that's gotten easier is I don't have to chase the money to make games anymore. Yeah. Like I'm, you know, I, the fact that I work for Take Two and they have confidence in me, I don't have to spend a ton of time going out and pitching game ideas mm-hmm. to publishers, which is nice because that's not you're pitching ideas to people who aren't game developers and their understanding of what the game development process, is, it, you know, that can be frustrating because they sort of don't really. When you're trying to convince people who don't make games that you're actually onto something, and <laughs> there's no real reason that they should understand it because they're not getting it. And look, and to be honest, you know, even I, you know, we don't know at the end of the day, we don't know if the thing we're making is going to be good or people are going to care about it or they're going to like it. You use your best judgment. So you're, it's a big guessing game all around. And it's nice not to have the, um, sort of have to go to a lot of, you know, meeting conference rooms to different publishers and mm-hmm. try to convince people when really nobody in the room knows anything, including me, about, you know, <laughs> it's gonna work and whether it's going to make money and whether it's going to be good. Because, you know, so many things can go right and so many things can go wrong in the period of time it takes to make a game that who really knows? And so right now I'm just sort of trading on my reputation and I can say, you know, I take two, like, look, just, you know, give me a, you know, I don't know. I tell them, like, I don't know if this is going to work. You know, I, I'm, <laughs> I'm pretty honest with them. And we have a relationship where they're, where they, I think if I came in, I'd say, oh my God, this is a slam dunk, guys. Here's the Excel file that tells you why we're going to make a zillion dollars off this and why it's going to be, a, you know, well reviewed and the fans are going to love it. They're going to cosplay it. They would look at me like, I think they would probably look at me like I was a liar. Like you're, like you're a second head. Yeah, ex- <laughs> a, 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 exactly. Be, be, because, because, but that's what you sort of have to do when you're starting out. So I don't miss that. I really don't miss mm-hmm. that because it's dishonest. And I, I tend to sort of end up saying a lot of things in rooms when I'm pitching to like, well, I don't know if this is going to work. And that's, and that, <laughs> that's, I don't know if that's a great thing to do, you know, when you're trying to sell something, but I don't have to do that game anymore, which is, which is really nice. Cause I've never very good at it. I think I've never very good at sort of lying about it. Yeah. But in terms of the development series, I'd rather be an, I'd rather be an independent developer now because you have engines and you have digital distribution. And those are the two most, those, those are things we didn't have back then. There didn't right. exist robust engines you can work on. There was no Epic. There was no, um, there was no Unity. There was none of that. So we had to make the technology from scratch, which is hard. You know, you had to write fucking sound drivers, you know, 
to make these, <laughs> oh, wow. make the sound like you had to write video drivers, you know, you were writing software renderers, you know, you didn't have those APIs, you didn't have that sophistication. But most importantly, I think, is you didn't have digital distribution. So you were fighting for shelf space. A, as an independent developer, which we were back then, you couldn't have a game without a publisher because how were you going to get it on the shelf at Walmart? Right, right. You know? right. And that's the only place. There was no Steam. There was no digital distribution. There was no web, really. Um, so I think that's the hugest advantage of being a developer now is you actually can build a relationship directly with your audience through Twitter and social media. You can um, you can sell the game directly, you know, through through either your own web page. You know, look at what Notch did with with with, with um, Minecraft. I yeah. bought that game when it was on his web page as a Flash game. Yeah, um, right. I did too. Yeah, it was like four bucks or whatever it was. Yeah, yeah, yeah I remember. Yeah, and he, you, you couldn't do that back then. There was, we just did that. That kind of didn't exist. Yeah. So all these layers, like you know, credit card acceptance, and so on, over over secure credit card transactions over the web. That sounds really boring, but that's really freeing to modern game developers. Now I'm sure they're probably going to be like, well, Levine's saying I walk, you know, both ways to school in the snow uphill, you know. <laughs> And I, I've heard to some degree that's true because there are new problems that you have to deal with. Um, right, right. But uh, I think I'd rather be an independent developer now than when I was an independent developer because you didn't. You, you there is a path without publishers now. Um, yeah, yeah. W w which is nice, and I've been very fortunate that you know Take Two has been very, very good to me. But I think I've had worse experiences with other publishers, and other people have had probably bad experiences with publishers. Look. It, the relationships are complicated. You're asking people for millions of dollars, <laughs> putting a lot of trust yeah. in you, and that you know, money relationships are complicated by, by definition. Right, well, and like you had, like you had alluded to before, is like you're you're going into a room of people that aren't creatives per se, yes. and you're trying to explain a creative process to them, which they <laughs> probably have a very cursory understanding of. So that I would imagine that can be pretty stressful. It, yeah, it, it, it's pretty stressful because really. You're in a room of people, including yourself, who don't really know what's going to happen in that period of time. Like, oh, let's make a deal for X million dollars for X period of years. And at the end of it, we'll provide you a product which is going to make you a lot more money than you invested. And that's what you tell them. And the truth is, they don't know. You don't know. It's, it's, a, bit of a, it's a bit of a charade, you know? Has the game industry become less of a creative place, do you think, recently? I mean, you know, we see... Uh, publishers uh, and devs kind of stick into the like we we're talking about before that you know the, the thing that makes money they want to do that again because they obviously their business they want to make money um, has creativity suffered at all do you think in the industry or is or is now a good time because the things you were talking about like you know people can basically set their own platform for distribution has that helped or has it been a hindrance like how do you see things shaking out as it were right now I think if digital distribution hadn't happened we would be a it would be a much less creative industry because you'd have, you know, what happens with everything, you end up with, it's like happening with movie, in movie theaters, right? You, only the biggest bets get into the theater. Um, yeah. And really most of the movies I'm watching now are, well, either TV, right? Um, because, <clears throat> or they're sort of movies that I get on, you know, they get released, that get maybe open in one theater at best and then they get released on Amazon, you know, through, through digital distribution. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And ima I keep, imagine if you didn't have digital distribution, if you just had shelf space, what kind of, what the game space would look like. It'll be t I think it'll be pretty grim um, because it would be very risk adverse, extremely risk adverse. And right now it's not, currently I think it's a fairly, it's getting risk adverse in sort of the big bets, you know, the huge, you know, $100 million bets. It's getting, but there's a lot of risk being taken um, genres are have uncalcified. Um, they are getting kind of calcified for a few years. I, I think it's actually a great time for creativity. I was just at Res, and the games I saw there, everything was different. Everything I couldn't sort of say that's exactly this or that's exactly that. I didn't see like you know fifteen military shooters and fifteen. I was just about to say, oh my god! I was just about to say, I can remember a time where all I would see was gritty brown and gray war shooters. Yeah, and then there's nothing wrong with those. I mean, I like those games. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But but you know, I uh, we I remember when we were gonna went to sell the company. Um, we had two, we had Take Two and another company, were were trying to buy our company for various reasons, and we had Bioshock in development at Take Two, very early stages, and then the other company, you know, we had a second team in Australia wanted us to do a second game and. 
That game was literally called, I believe the game they wanted to was literally called Call of Honor. And it oh, was, no. <laughs> and it was a World War II shooter, but it's like, no, but this will be different. And it was so depressing that, you know, Take-Two had a lot of advantages besides that, but it, I just couldn't even consider... I did not want to make that game. Not because I have any problem with war shooters. I just felt that they were chasing somebody else's success. Yeah. And I generally feel when you try to do that, that's one of those things that I think executives, some executives might think is a path to success because, um, but I generally think that if somebody else has been there first and done it well, your chances of unseating them, unless you're like Blizzard, you know, who really understands how to do something, take a formula and do it better. Then it's it's harder. It's harder to do, and your and your chances of success are actually fairly low. And just also, Call of Honor. I just like thought of like right. saying that name in an interview, which is <laughs> every ounce of life that I had left in me. Um, right. So yeah, so I, I I don't think it's good business. I don't think it's good creativity. But I was at Res. I saw so many, uh, and I, I I tweeted about some of them or, or Facebooked about some of them. Just some great games I saw there. Yeah, I think today the the market too. When you're talking about gamers specifically, I think people are so savvy that if if they were to release a game called Call of Honor, I'm pretty sure people would spite not buy it yes. because yes. it's like, please, really, come on, we're 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 smarter oh, than that. They would don't, don't yeah, don't do that to us. You they know, wouldn't it's like, just do that. We want to spend sixty dollars. Yeah. Oh, they well yeah yeah probably, it would it would launch wars. endless mountains of jokes. I'm sure. Yeah. Well, yeah, there's that too. Yeah, the meme factory. Going the meme full, factory full production. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, it was, so yeah, it would be a gift to the meme factory, but 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 it would, yes, it, the cost would be my soul. Yeah, yeah exactly. exactly. Well, I think you made the right choice on that yes. one. Nick. <laughs> I don't know. Me- memes are pretty good. You know, it might be worth. Oh, oh no, no, you don't. You don't. You don't want to. You don't want to have, have to have to give up parts of yourself to say that you've made uh, another war shooter. Yeah, and, and, and there was, like, I think when we made SWAT, we knew what we were getting into. We made a game called SWAT 4. Yeah. Um, I think that that was a job we did because we sort of needed the work. Um, mm. <laughs> but I think the team found something in it to make it their own. And it really was the, you know, the roots of sort of creating st- visual storytelling in environments. If you go back and look at that game, there's a bunch of moments in that game that sort of predicated what we ended up doing in Bioshock. So we sort of brought, we took a game that was very sort of Spartan and brought a visual storytelling sense to it. So we found our own voice in it. And I look, it was SWAT 4. We knew, like, it wasn't like pretending to be another game. It really was, you know, a follow-up to that game. But it wasn't a game that I was particularly excited about making. And I didn't actually have a lot to do with it except sort of consult on the visual aspect of the team no, I think they showed they really showed their craft in that game, and they, and they and they made I think probably the best of the SWAT games in my opinion. Um, yeah. Um, well, it's I mean it's it's a pretty well regarded game, honestly. I mean, hell, I, I there was there was a uh, there seemed to be a, this resurgence of people um, doing you play not you plays, <laughs> excuse me, doing uh, let's plays of it in the last couple of months. Oddly enough, I was just like, why are people playing SWAT four again? That's kind of weird. But yeah, there's a lot of people revisiting it, and they're very fond of it, and. Honestly, it, it it holds up. I mean, when I was watching some of these the Let's Plays, I was like, "Oh, this looks fun." You know, this looks like it would be a good time. So I think they I mean, I, yeah. they, they they understood the game. The team understood the game, and they really want. They were excited about it, and I think they did. I think it was probably just as a piece of craft work. It was probably pound for pound one of our best titles in terms of just excellent craft. Um, yeah. Not not the most innovative game of all time, but I think the guys just really refined some great craft work on that. And it's yeah, I'm, like it just worked. It yes. did what it needed to it do. Did, it did what it was supposed to do, and it did it well. Yeah, yeah. Which is which is something today we see as somewhat of a problem. It would seem in a lot of games cases where games will come out and there will be a day one 15 gig patch or something like that, and then the game is still buggy as hell, or somebody has a you know, a goofy looking face, you know, all the controversy that's got around like Mass Effect and all that sort of thing. So, um, yeah, it's like there's there's a lot to be said when a game comes out and it works. It's just like, oh, wow, this is it's it's done well. It's it's programmed correctly to the point where when I hit the button, it does the thing the button's supposed to do. It's like that, like satisfying. to me, that is that is uh, a, a great thing when I pay money for a game and it works. I'm very, very happy with that. I'm very happy with that sort of thing. So. Yeah, yeah, and that's as games got more complex, that's gotten you know 
it's kind of harder to get right. And, and generally, the expectation yeah. how something's going to launch kind of broken, uh, especially multiplayer, because that's such a hard, pro- that's such a hard problem. <laughs> all, the, but, all the net code, yeah. Yeah. We're, yeah. We, 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 we've launched relatively stable products, um, and that, you know, that, that I give the credit to the sort of the culture of the company about how they, a lot of that is how you build your software too. Um, when you're working on a game, you could either continue to innovate and make the game, or the, there's one extreme where you sort of don't care about that. You just keep innovating. There's another extreme, which is that you make sure the game is a stable development platform all the time, but that slows down your, your innovation mm-hmm. cycle. So finding the balance between those two things is is, is tricky to do, but um, but you know it's one of those sort of what's the right formula? Uh, I don't know. Let's just try to let's just always try to be in the right you know place in that formula. But that's a very tricky formula to manage, and that, yeah. we've done that reasonably well. Reasonably well. Well, you've had a pretty good success rate, I'd say. So yeah. Yeah, I don't think we've ever launched anything that was really broken. I think we've launched yeah. ever, you know things had some problems and some bugs sometimes, but. I don't think anything was broken at launch that we've done. I'm, I'm sure the internet will remind me if we have, but I don't, I don't think <laughs> it was broken. For sure. I, well, I and, have... that, and that's one of the great things about uh, digital platforms is that you can fix those things now. It's not just like there's a cart with this game-breaking bug that doesn't allow you to get past level 11 and yes. you're kind of screwed at that point. So it's kind of nice that there is that ability to go back and say, hey, we can fix this thing that was fucked up, so it's okay. Yeah, and and, and, you, and you're yeah. That's another great thing about sort of distribution too. Is it just sort of happens organically? Like all of a sudden, your game just keeps you know on Steam, your game just keeps getting better, you know, because it keeps updating itself and, and people keep working on it. So that's that's another nice thing about distribution. Where before, if you launched, um, you were sort of that was the game that people were stuck with forever. All right, shall we shall we dive into the Bioshock land, Ken? It's time for Bioshock. All right, I guess we'll start this off. Uh, the um, I guess Bioshock was set in 1960, mm-hmm. correct? Yeah. Okay, so, uh, but the when when you look at Rapture, though, the aesthetic is very much a, an Art Deco's 1920s kind of uh, aesthetic. Um, is this, uh, like, specifically uh, akin to Andrew Ryan and his kind of unchanging kind of his... Uh, I guess ethos or his ideas of how things should be, and this is the this is the perfect moment in time, or was it just from being isolated for you know however many years they were down there before people started to really come down and see what's happening when you got into the story of Bioshock? Well, our architectural styles don't tend not to just sort of you know last for five years. Like you know they, they build up and then people well, but yeah. buildings, buildings take a long time to build. So, but yeah, I mean the real the real Art Deco period happened. You know when you start getting. Um, you know, uh, a move away from ornamentational style and towards structural style happened, you know, the 1910s, 1920s, really. But then you kept having buildings, like I'm not sure when the Chrysler Building was built and when the Empire State Building was built and when Rockefeller Center was built. Well, that was, you know, the, probably the 30s and the 40s. So it, it's it was, Rapture was, was founded in 46. So it was still a pretty active form. Um, okay. I think of that year. Um and certainly, you know, and there's some, look, there's some songs that, you know, I came up with that smuggling. One of the reasons I came up with that smuggling plot um, in Rapture was I wanted there to be music that was done after 1946. So, <laughs> uh, you know, there's there's a bit of cheating. And I think one of the songs, yeah, I mean, there's a bit, there's a tiny bit of cheating there, but it's, it's mostly, it's mostly in the in, in the ballpark, the music. And, right. and the, like, there's nothing from... After 1960, I think the closest is a Patsy Cline song, which I think is like 1958 or 1959. But um, it, 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 it's mostly it's mostly in the ballpark, I think. Yeah, I want to uh, just really quick. I mean, it's it's more Bioshock Infinite, but it's closely related to what you're saying. Is I really liked hearing "Girls Just Want to Have Fun" in the Calliope. I at at, for, at first I didn't realize what I was what I was hearing. But I was like, wait a minute, wait a minute. Did yeah. they did they did they do what I think they did? And then I saw the notes with the character who was hearing things from the tears. So, yo, know, it's 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 good when you cheat. That was that was an effective use of your cheating. Thank well, you. that, that plot line about about Fink's brother stealing those songs. That was another thing that I had to sort of figure out. I <laughs> wanted that music notion in the game, and I had that idea for that music notion. I worked with Jim Bonney, and Jim Bonney worked with a ton of great musicians, and we made all that happen. But I sort of need to explain why that was, and so I came up with that plot about Fink's brother hearing music through the tears because I I really wanted that. Thing in the game because it was something I, an idea I, I had just came to me and I kind of fell in love with and the songs ended up being you know Jim and his group did such a great job oh, they they worked so well in the game um, 
uh, it just it gave that feeling of 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 of, of cognitive dissonance, which I really wanted mm -hmm. when you're in that space. That because there's one thing saying, you know, the character feels cognitive dissonance. It's another thing making the player feel cognitive dissonance, and the music I think was a, a big component of that. Okay, so I mean, you've you've kind of been doing this in in this interview. You've you've been pretty honest. It, it surprised me how you know when most people when they're in an interview or they're speaking to press. Though I don't know if we consider ourselves press, uh, people try and present sort of like the most flowery uh, presentation of something, as where you're pretty open about how you feel you handle things. Like in the case of you think Irrational Games uh, had trouble nailing the endings, and I think the boss fights of Bioshock, and that that was a relief to me. It's like, oh, thank goodness, I don't I don't have to walk on eggshells. <laughs> to walk on eggshells. Yeah. Yeah. And I normally don't like when a game brings heavy attention to player choice because then it's it's there and it's like hard to not see it. Uh, but with Jack's mental conditioning, I think you, I mean, you said you were lucky. How, whatever you want to chalk it up to, I think it was just like expertly balanced with, with Bioshock. And while I don't think it's necessarily a boss battle, I think Andrew Ryan's death was ideologically a boss battle. Yeah. yeah you know, yeah. It's, it's a fight between the story and the mechanics. And then I would think, Ryan's beliefs, you know, of of a man chooses fate, and I think, I mean, I don't, I don't know, I, I don't, I don't know if I think you could say better than I could just how much Ryan uh, Andrew cared about Jack, but I think a part of it is is him maybe secretly hoping that his illegitimate son would overcome this and perhaps also be a great man. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I think that was Ryan's, and in my view, Ryan's intention was to give something to his son, which was yeah. free, and um, you know. I guess there's two questions there. One is about how you handle interviews, right? And one is about well, no, no, that that was that was me just saying thank you for like being that person, so I don't have to walk on a tightrope. <laughs> well, well, um, well, here's the thing about that is that it gets tricky because sometimes people ask very invasive questions, you know, mm -hmm, like about, yeah. about that that are that are primarily about like development processes, and, and I'm much more comfortable talking about my own failings than I am talking about other people's failings. <laughs> Yeah, 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 yeah. I'm not going to be there like, well, the reason that happened is, you know, guy X from the team did this and it was really right, bad right, right. because that's mm -hmm. not my place. That's not really my place. So, you know, I'm never going to be comfortable talking about other people, mistakes they make. But myself, the problem is when you when you when you when people ask you questions and there's obviously the ele elephant in the room is the boss battles aren't good. Right. So mm -hmm. ha if you're not honest about it, you're sort of both going through the charade about <laughs> about it. And and I don't want to do that because I'm I'm not really sure how to. The only time it gets tricky is when people are asking you about things that happen that you know you have a long complicated story that involves a lot of people mm -hmm. and 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 I don't think that ever looks good or is good to be doing because if the person is not there to give their side of it, right, right, you, right. you just end up in and dump you know throwing somebody under the bus. So you end up the only option there, and that's when I get uncomfortable because you then you just sort of have to end up being evasive about it not because you're trying to hide the truth just because you don't feel comfortable right talking about something that that went badly and for for a variety of reasons but in general i think telling the truth is by far is by far the best place to be and the simplest place to be the real setup for the question was is did you plan for that scene you know andrew ryan's death to go differently because like i like i said i liked how it worked like it works on so many levels but a small part of me wonders did you want to give the player the option to somehow overcome? I mean, I, I can't think of a mechanical way it would have been meaningful, but did I, did you have that thought and then think, what if what if they don't have to kill him? Well, we we I mean, look, originally Andrew Ryan was the villain. You know, is the villain of the game. The natural thing was you'd fight the dude, right? That is yeah. the natural thing, and I think that's certainly there was a time in the game where that was the normal assumption we'd make. And right, right, right. At some point, and I think I struggled with that because I just thought it would be ridiculous. And <laughs> so, yeah, if Andrew got in a big robot and you had to fight him. I mean, that's what happens in video games. That's what happens in movies, right, yeah. too, right? And I, I find that, um, you know, you sort of fight the sub boss in the movie, and then, you know, your hero fights the boss. And I find that to be um, unsatisfying. Um, the best interaction between hero and villains. In, in 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 stories is generally putting them in the room where they can't fight, you know, and you see that in the best, you know, the diehard relationship where they were talking to each other over the radio, but they couldn't get at each other you know, between Hans Gruber. Um, you know, that that's a great, you want to get the villain and the hero in the room talking to each other. 
I, I, I always think if you can. And so that was a struggle with that game to figure that out. But, you know, I sort of said, well, what if you never, you know, what if they don't, what if you don't fight Ryan? What if, you know, what if it's a different approach? And then the question was, well, what is that approach? And that's sort of what led to the would you kindly moment. It wasn't, it wasn't in the script, you know, I don't know when it came in, but it wasn't sort of the original concept um, because the original concept was quite probably quite to do something what we've seen before, which is how you fight the dude. Right. Mm-hmm. Was that your I'll be back moment, do you think? What do you, oh, yeah. yeah I, <laughs> I make this joke is I don't want to be at, you know, kids birthday parties when I'm 70 saying, ah, would you kindly, huh? Would you kindly have some chocolate cake? You know? Right. You know, yeah, so it's probably the moment I'm most known for in, in, in games, but but you have to be very careful about that, that you're not just sort of trying to repeat that because you then you are the guy doing children's parties, repeating, the, you know, the, it's like the catchphrase. Um, right, right. So you have to watch out for that. But, yeah, it was one of those moments. I, I, I think it was probably the moment that, you know, if you had to sort of say, you know, well, what's what's the, you know, wh- what, what will people remember about you at this stage in your life? It's probably that moment, I would guess right yeah honestly that was that was the one thing about the game i really didn't like i hated the idea that i had to kill ryan like i i literally sat there for maybe like 10 or 15 minutes hoping that some magical prompt was gonna come up and say oh hey you know maybe let's find another way or something or i was looking around and trying to figure out a way around this i was like god i don't want to do this i don't want to do this did you did you get any feedback from people like that i mean is that something you've heard before is this you know, I, I just I wonder if I'm if this was unique to me or if, if other people had expressed that it was kind of a one of those moments that they're like, oh, man, do I got to do this? Well, we, we got it. The feedback was pretty positive, but I'm not going to deny that there's potentially a, there. You know, there's always probably a better, path, a smarter path that if you had figured it out, that would be even more interesting. Um, I don't know what that path is. And I'm not mm-hmm. but I'm not saying that there is no potential better path. It's the best. Right. It's best we had at the time. And, you know, and you're lucky if generally the best you have at the time is something people like at all because generally getting people to like something is very 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 difficult yeah well and and not to say that it didn't work i mean it worked but i just when it when i'm faced with a a non-choice is i guess the thing that bugged me it was like well you you have to do this sorry pal you got you got to hit button a and you got to hit him or button b or whatever it was you know so right and, and and we sort of we sort of quote excused ourselves by making that sort of central to jack's story but right. that was to some degree, you could say that was, um, you know, that was that gave us a, like a one-time afford it uh, allowance for getting out of that kind of problem. You know, well, I could say to you, well, my my creative intention was that Jack had no choice, so you had no choice. But that was a co- that's a cover to some degree because right because what do games want to be? Games want to be an agency vehicle, right? For gamers, they want to say yes to the gamer. They don't want to say no. We twisted that story to support the fact that we had no agency in that moment. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Lack of agency. And we sort of made that, we turned a weakness into a strength. But really, what's our goal? You know, in the long run, it's not, ah, you have no agency, fucker. It's, <laughs> you know, haha, it fits into the plot, see? Ah? Yeah. <laughs> it really wants would to you be- kindly? <laughs> would you kindly, kids? Ah, have a chocolate yeah. cake. Um, <laughs> And, but, but, it, but, but it's really, it's really, the goal is not that. The goal, you know, yeah. is, is to provide more and more agency. And the thing we're working on now is, you know, it, it is, that's the whole goal of it. But, but that's really hard. And so right. I think I got, I got to get out of jail free card for that game. But I, I think that's not, that's not, that's not where games should go, right? Games should go towards agency. Right, um, right, right. That's a very specialized then- solution. Yeah, but then uh, I, I imagine you somewhat fall into a trap of uh, you begin spoon feeding people, and that's and that can be you know that can be a slippery slope to go down is like because then you kind of you're you're almost pandering, I guess. But like with a, like as much as I didn't like that decision, it worked. I mean, it, it worked within the story. Mm-hmm. You know, it worked within the elements of the story. So you know, it was, it was very effective because it put me in like as somebody I was invested. I was like, oh man, you know, I was I was having a serious you know, for lack of a better way to put it, I was having a, a bit of an emotional quandary about it. So I, I felt that it was effective in that way. Like looking back on it, I can say, oh, this actually, I was really invested in this because I was having problems going through with doing this. So I thought it was great in that respect. I mean, but I still didn't like it. <laughs> I, I have I have a question about Infinite. 
yeah. but before I do that, I want to share a quick anecdote similar to what you guys are talking about. It's like, so with, with the scene with Ryan, you know, it's just a button push. And I think I was probably the only person who felt this way. But at The Last of Us, spoilers for anyone who has to play The Last of Us, you hand Ellie. Uh, yeah, you've played The Last of Us, right, Ken? Um, actually, I haven't. Oh, no. Should I not? Should I not explain it? You, yeah, I'd rather actually because I'm going to. It's been one of those games that <laughs> that, that I, I, I've, I've had not had the chance to get to yet. So uh, but I, I definitely okay. I know the story is important. So actually, sadly enough, if you could avoid spoiling it. Yeah, no, 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 no. You are a guest. I will not spoil the game. <laughs> okay. I will stick to my question. Okay. Um, okay, so it felt like with Infinite, you were trying to re-explore the idea of player choice or the illusion of it, but it seemed to kind of get lost along the way with the whole universe hopping and just the fast and loose quantum mechanics. So considering all the ideas that you were kicking around with Infinite, do you feel that it fulfilled the potential, or do you think in hindsight there was something you would have wanted to push harder on? Yeah, Infinite was a, was a game that um, had a very complicated development cycle, and there were a lot of decisions that were sort of made as a reaction to challenges in the development cycle. And it's not an experience that it was a very tricky game to make. So there were things that I was very, very happy with it in it. You know, like the relationship between the character, you and Elizabeth, I was very, very happy with. I felt that, you know, people felt connected to that character, the creation of that character. And Lutest is a lot of elements in the story, but there's a lot oh, of- Oh, I love the Lutest. I'm sorry, I just had to say that. Uh, thanks, thanks. There's a lot of things <laughs> I was very happy with it, and visually, aesthetically, I thought it worked very well. There's a lot of things that were a function of, oh my god, what are we going to do? This thing didn't work. We underestimated how long this was going to take, and we had to sort of react in real time and, and string things together that we had to find a way to string. Like, there was a level that there's just no way it was going to happen in time. Mm -hmm. And so, we cut it. And, and that level is really where sort of a lot of the, a lot of certain aspects of the plot development happened. And we had to lose that level. And I had to stitch together. And unlike a level like in, you know, in a, a game that's more, you know, less specifically story oriented, you have to do a lot of work to, right. to, to string together missing narrative elements. So, right. I, so it was sort of a, a work of a great game development mastery in the sense of like we had... Well, so, so, so sorry, it was like terrible game development that got us into a lot of problems and a lot of very genius work to get us out of the problems so the thing worked <laughs> at all. Because it was like, like it, it, it took like the right people making the right choices to get out of a very deep ditch. We ended up making a lot of decisions with sort of a gun to our head. And it was not nearly as close to the vision of what, like Bioshock was very close to what we had imagined, Bioshock 1. Infinite was more of a, how do we make this work given the problems we have? Um, right. and, and I think that it was a more impressive feat of development considering where we were. Like a year before that game shipped, I was sort of like, oh my God, like how, <laughs> how are we going to make this work? Right, um, right, right. And uh, we made it work. And it came out and it you know, reviewed well and it sold, you know, it sold probably twice as many units as Bioshock 1. Um, but nice. it wasn't as close to the vision of what I thought it should be as Bioshock 1 was, even though Bioshock 1 is a much more limited scope, mm -hmm. it, it's sort of like the, the creative vision and the actual product were more aligned than the creative vision of Bioshock Infinite and the actual product because of a lot of development problems we had. But the fact that it sort of came out as well as it did was a, was a, a, a function of real sort of like game developers really working in their craft to make something that, was, that worked. But a year before it shipped, it was really fucked up. Gotcha, gotcha. Well, for what it's worth, I felt a much stronger connection to Elizabeth than Ellie from Last of Us. So, hopefully, hopefully that's a uh, that that's that counts for something. I, I think that has a lot to do with with the performance. You know, the, the, like mm -hmm. like my relationship, probably one of my most satisfying creative relationships ever, was with Courtney Draper um, and and Troy working on that game. Um, you know, that relationship was something that was, you know, they had to react to a, a changing play field of, of what mm -hmm. was happening with the game. And, you know, I was very open with them about what was going on. And I'd come in and say, well, this is the problem we're having. This is what we have to do. And their emotional commitment to those characters sold that game incredibly well. Like they were, you know, right, right, right. Yeah, I got very lucky with those guys and their commitment was, and my friendship with them lasted this day. You know, that was a very 
intimate experience working with them on that. And they were wonderful to, to work with. And I, I owe a lot of that game's success to, to, the, to those actors. And their yeah. I would say, I would say that uh, kind of like, you know, if you watch Star Wars without the, uh, without the John Williams score, it's not a very good movie. And I kind of feel the same way about Infinite was the, the, the performances that the actors gave. I thought they really, you know, they made that, they, they really tied it together in a way. And there, there was a sincerity and an earnestness to their, to their performance that really got you in there. It really got you invested. It really made you like the characters. And, you know, it made it, it not to say that it made it real, but it made it something that you could connect with. Whereas, you know, a lesser skilled actor could have just kind of phoned it in and, it, it wouldn't have had the impact that it did. So, you know, it, cheers to cheers to them for what they did for sure. You could basically say to Courtney, like you could, I need to get here with this scene <laughs> and we would work on the text and she would get there every time. And, and then, and she'd put herself in this incredible emotional space, space and then she would be like, okay, what's next? And <laughs> you know, so, so, so I, that was the thing that got closest to, like, that was very close to like that character was very close to me what I thought was my creative hope for that character. Um, mm, right. And Booker Booker and Elizabeth, and Elizabeth both were very close to, where a lot of other things I thought I did, we didn't do as good a job and to getting what the ideal version of that vision was. You know, you have, you have actors, like someone like Andrew Ryan, you know, and, and, and um, um, Armin Shimmerman was very much exactly what I heard in my head, you know, and very much right. exactly what my hope for the character was. And Booker and Elizabeth were the same way. And I, I've had a lot of good luck with actors in general. I, I think that goes back to that I've, I, I've been working with actors, directing actors since I was a teenager. And so I value that relationship and I understand that relationship. I think I understand how to work with actors better than I understand anything in what I do. And that's, and that's um, I think I'm a better writer director than I am a writer. Um, because I think just as a writer, you're just writing words on a page where working with a character actor and getting performance is a whole different task. So I, I, I don't know how good a writer I am. I know I'm a <laughs> strong writer director and I, and I right. tend, I tend to know how to cast and, and that makes your job a lot easier. If you find the right actor, fuck your right. Your job as a writer director gets so much easier. You know? <laughs> it clicks. Yeah. And you're like, Oh, right. I'm a great writer director. Meanwhile, you know, probably most of it is, is the performance from the, from, from, you know, that you're listening at people. So now that you're you have your own studio, Ghost Story Games, do you feel that a smaller team is perhaps a smarter approach to making games when it seems a lot of the industry wants to push to make bigger and more expensive titles? I think it depends on who's, you know, it depends on the players. For the group mm -hmm. of people, myself, you know, and myself as a creator, because I'm not a, I'm not a, I'm not a, you know. I'm technically an executive at the company, right? But I'm not, <laughs> yeah. I don't think I'm a particularly good at being an executive. I think I'm particularly good at being a career. I, I think I'm reasonably good at being a, a creator. And when you have a, a 150, 200, 300, 400, 500 person team, what you really have to be good is as an executive. You have to be a good manager of people and a good, you know, a communicator and an organizer. And those aren't necessarily aligned with being, um, with being a creative person, right? That, that's a whole right. different skill set. And I think there's some people, like Rod Ferguson is a guy who came in to sort of produce, you know, Infinite at the end in the last year. And Rod, that's what Rod did really well, is Rod is a great organizer of people and a great communicator and a great developer. He has a very different skill set than I do. I'm, I'm, I'm sort of really good at, I, I think the thing I'm best at is getting the best work out of individuals. But there's only so many individuals you can interact with on a product. So when you have a 150, 200 person team, right. you're not really interacting with a lot of those people. You're not directly interacting with them. So you have to build these communication structures that communicate to them. But I'm really good at being in a room with a dude or a girl and saying, hey, here's how I think you can do the best work you can on mm -hmm. this thing. And I think I'm pretty good at that. But if I'm not in the room with them and I'm not saying them, I don't have a personal relationship with them that I don't understand them as an artist. Right, you know? right. And that takes time to really understand somebody how they work best as an artist and so now that i'm working with a much smaller group like i can sit in a room with, with somebody like you know whether that's you know whoever, whoever it is on the team and i can actually know them well enough where i can say i think i have something i can say that can help you be better mm -hmm. even than you already are because everybody i have is already excellent like if i died <laughs> i tell them this all the time if i die tomorrow i think they could finish this thing and make it fucking awesome and that's my <laughs> that's my goal is to become sort of that I build a culture that wherein they can be their best and be awesome 
and deliver their best work. It's hard to do when you don't have relationships with those people. When you have huge teams, right. you just don't have those relationships. It's just not possible to have relationships with that many people. There's not enough time in the day. So I prefer a small team environment because then I can do, I can add value to the individuals on the team in a way I can't when there's a larger team. How many how many folks do you have working at Ghost Story currently? About twenty five. Twenty five. Okay, so it's oh, it's, so it's very scaled down from like the the things that you've done in the past then. Yeah, I mean, we use a lot of outside contractors, but that is mostly okay. I depend upon the people I have relationships with to build those relationships with those contractors. Right, right. And so, like a guy like Sean Robertson, who's my art director, I work with you know since I've known since the Looking Glass days. I mean, he okay. came to us in like about two thousand or so. Um, Sean knows me well enough that he can be a proxy me with those guys <laughs> in terms of what I want. But also, that's a small part of what he does. Most of what he does is he's a great art director. And he and he has great instincts, um, but you know we this this organ this group was co-founded by a group of people who had worked on Infinite and Bioshock One together, and we all knew each other and we all understood each other's quirks and and that's a lot easier. Knowing each other right. is the most important part to successful game development. Knowing what yeah. strengths are and what each other's weaknesses are is the most important part of game development, and that's that that that's an affordance you get as a small team. Right. That sounds good. I'm I'm looking forward to what you guys put out. I, yeah, I like sure. what I'm hearing. Can I can I ask one more question before you take off? Yeah. Have you have you completely closed the door on the world of Bioshock? Or is there something else there potentially? Be it a game, be it something else. You know, non. You know, you don't have to specify, obviously. But do you think you're ever going to go back to that place? Look, I, I've got a big daddy in my house. I've got a giant stack of <laughs> daddy in my house. And it's because I owe, you know, I owe a lot to that world. And I'm very, you know, it's something very near and dear to my heart. Right now, I'm not making a Bioshock game. But, you know, we're still making products, you know, like statues and action figures and stuff. I'm still yeah. involved in that. I, 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 I would never say never about something. I just want to make sure, you know, to me, it was important that I do something different. So I become the Bioshock guy you know like right, that, right. that that and that, that i think is I, I think artists need to need to try different things and different approaches but no i look it's something that of course i i have nothing but a huge amount of love and affection for that and i get it gets fed back to me when i see fan i see fan art you know where <laughs> we just had a we're doing a contest now yeah, where, contest where we're having people fans send their fan art in to decorate we work with you know i interact with cosplayers all the time you know i i i you know i i i love the people's connection to it and i i have to honor that the, the people's connection to it you know when i have people at events come up and tell me that bioshock got them through a particularly difficult period in their life or something like that because I, I have products i have movies and games that i feel the same way about and i know that they help me get through certain experience in my life so i will never be i will never undervalue that but right now it's not something i will, i feel i should be working on as a game um right gotcha. now my life yeah. right now awesome well ken uh we appreciate you spending the time with us it was it was really great to talk to you thank you again sir really really appreciate you taking the time to sit down with us thanks guys and uh, and i appreciate it and sorry for all our technical difficulties but um i have a lot of yeah, things happen all right yeah, guys. things happen maybe right. maybe in a couple of years we'll come back and we'll talk about the the thing you're working on again at some point i, I would like or, that or just come back and shoot the shit yeah <laughs> i would like that too. Yeah. i would like that all right. Too. all right thanks cool. guys thanks a lot ken thanks. take care man okay. Bye-bye. If you enjoyed our show, please like, subscribe, and share links to our work on places like Twitter, Facebook, Tumblr, and other social media sites you enjoy. Also consider supporting us by becoming a patron on patreon.com. You can also send us tips or sign up for a subscription on vid.me forward slash big and robot. If you'd like to contact us, check the show description below for various links to our social media accounts, as well as our VidMe, YouTube, iTunes, and Patreon accounts. Thanks again for stopping by, and we'll see you next time.